you. Thank you for the many gifts that we receive through your Son. Lord, may we never take them for granted. We know that every moment, every breath, every second is a gift. And we are so thankful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Lord, today we think of those who, around Christmas time, it's hard to think about what they have. They think about what they've lost or what they're going through. Lord, we know Christmas can be a really tough season. And so we pray that your peace and your joy and your hope and your love would rest on us today. That we would turn toward you and feel refreshed and feel excited and be able to focus on the reason for this season, which is you. Jesus Christ, you're the greatest gift ever. Thank you for coming for us. We love you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. This time I'd like to welcome our ushers forward. We're going to receive God's tithes and offerings today. I want to thank everybody who continues to faithfully support our church through our tithes and offerings. It's because of you that we are able to do what we do. And if you haven't started giving, oh man, is Christmas a great day to start. Let's pray. Abba Father, as we receive these tithes and offerings, we know that they are in response to the gift of your Son, that they are an act of worship, so we pray that you would take them, bless them, multiply them, and use them to extend your kingdom here in Hillsborough, in Washington County, in Oregon, in the USA, and all around the world. We give thanks to you this day, in your holy name, amen. A very, very, very Merry Christmas to you all. I got a question for you this morning, and I want you to think about it, okay? What is the greatest Christmas gift you have ever received? Think through. Some of you, uh, you know, you only have about 10 Christmases to think through. Some of you, Harry, have more. We have had many, many Christmases. What was your favorite gift that you ever received? You got it in your mind? Anybody want to volunteer and tell us what their favorite Christmas gift of all time was? Forrest. I wanted to be home for Christmas. You wanted to be home for I Christmas. Was always guaranteed in the military. That's true. So there was a uh, late night flight to go for the movie and home just in time. Ah, that's very sweet. Forrest got to be home with his family on Christmas. He had been in the military, and that wasn't always an option. That's very sweet. That's a good gift. Mr. Mize. Yeah, you. That guy. Yeah, I see you carrying that around all the time. How long ago did you get that? Hard to remember. Fair enough. A lot of time. Anybody? Cherie. Emma. By the way, happy birthday. You're welcome. Emma, pretty good present. Caused you a lot of stress, a lot of strife over the years, but worth the investment. Good. Gary. Cherie! <laughs> Merry Christmas and happy birthday and all that good stuff. Yeah. We, we have a special thing in my family, too. When you ask my mom what was her greatest birthday present, she says it was me, because we share a birthday, too. So, oh, yeah. So when my birthday happens, you better say happy birthday to my mom, too. <laughs> the thing about a great gift, the, the, when you think about the greatest gift you've ever had, what made it special? Why is that the greatest gift that you ever had? See, my favorite gift that I've probably ever received oh, was a Nintendo 64. <laughs> yes. Christmas Day, 1997. I can still remember opening the package, looking and seeing that box, and my brain just melted down. I was about, uh, I was 10 and I was super excited. This was the new awesome thing. This was the first video game system that was exclusively mine, and I played the wheels off that thing. It brought me a lot of joy. I spent all day Christmas playing GoldenEye, which probably isn't a very Christmassy thing to do, playing a James Bond game, but what are you gonna do? 
And every time I think of Christmas and I think of my greatest gift ever, I go back to that Christmas. Because it was a special time. Life was pretty simple. I just got up on Christmas morning, went under the tree, came out with something really cool, and then played with it all day. Back then, I didn't have to worry about taxes or, or any of the other things that can be stressful towards the end of the year. It was special. And so this week, I was thinking through what made that gift special for me. And I ran my theory. I actually called my mother this week, and I asked her, what's your favorite gift that you've ever gotten? She told me. Hers was lame. But <laughs> if mom's out there watching, love you, Ma. Um, but uh, I asked her, and then I started breaking down, OK, what made this gift special for you? And it seems like our gifts checked all the same boxes. And maybe your favorite gift of all time checked all the same boxes as well. The best gifts are always from a special giver. It's rarely something anonymous. It's usually from someone you care about really deeply. Second, the gift is valuable. It's rarely something that comes out of the dollar store. And it doesn't mean that it has to be expensive. It just has value for you. Some of the best gifts are free. It has to be unique, you know. It, 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 usually when it's a special gift, it stands out from the others because it's not like the others. It's usually something useful, and it comes right in the nick of time. And so if this is sort of where the goalposts are for the greatest gift of all time, what would it take for a gift to top my favorite gift of all time? What would it take for a gift to be so special, for the giver to be so special, for it to be so valuable, so unique, so useful, and so timely that it could actually be better than your favorite Christmas gift of all time? I've been asking myself that question this week. And another way to ask it is this. What do we all want for Christmas this year? We're going to be in um, John chapter 4 here in a little bit, which is probably going to seem a little strange. This is not the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. This is actually a story about when Jesus was an adult. But I think it really points to the greatest gift of all time. When I think about a gift that could be better than the best gift I've ever received, and it would be a gift that we all want, not just me, I think about that gift and I think I figured out what it is. The gift that we all want for Christmas, the best gift, the gift that could be better than any other gift we've ever received is this. Time. I think the gift we all want is time. The ability to go back in time and fix our mistakes. Time to invest, to discover and live out what our life's purpose is. To go back and say, oh, if I could tell my younger self, this is how the world works, how would the trajectory of my life have changed? And we wish we had more time to spend with loved ones. I think the gift we all want for Christmas is time. And this gift checks all the boxes. According to Ecclesiastes, God is the only one who can give the gift of time. So the giver is very special. Time is our most precious and limited resource. It's the only thing you can't get back. So it's very valuable. No two moments are identical. So time is a very unique gift. Time provides us opportunities to learn and grow, to discover and experience so, time is very useful. And most situations in life would improve if we just had a little more time to go through them. Time is timely. I think time is the gift we all want for Christmas. And in case you haven't heard the good news yet, God offers you that gift today. You can have the best gift ever today. This is why Jesus Christ came. This is why we celebrate his birth. This is why we say that joy has come to the world. Do you want to redeem the mistakes of your past? Do you want to be freed from the guilt of your actions and use your mistakes for good instead of the damage they may have caused? 
Do you want to discover your purpose in this life and embrace it? Do you want to become someone who changes the world? Do you want to live beyond death and spend eternity with those you love? Do you want more time? Jesus encountered someone who I think wanted some more time. And we read about them in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And this is God's word for us today. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. It's, it's little notes like that that tell me the scriptures are real and were really written by real people. Have you ever been in the middle of the story? Now, people were saying, but that's not what happened. Okay, back to the story. I love verses like that. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God... And who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming out here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. 
Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. God's word for us today. Let's pray. Jesus, take your words and make them powerful today. May our eyes be open, our ears be open. May we hear what you are saying to us. Lord, speak to us clearly, like a voice in our ears, we pray. In your holy name, amen. So, this is kind of a very typical scenario in the Bible. When a prophet comes and meets a woman at a well. The thing that is different about this story is that Jesus doesn't end up marrying her. Because in every other circumstance in the Bible, Moses shows up to a well, he gets hitched. Jacob shows up to a well, he gets hitched. Twice. This situation is pretty typical for the ancient Near East. Jesus is sitting at a well. But here's where the story gets kind of weird. He's sitting at a well in Samaria. And a woman comes out at noon. And Jesus talks to her. Those are all very weird things. Those don't happen in these kinds of stories. Samaritans and Jews hated each other. The Samaritans and Jews used to be a part of one nation. But in 922 B.C., they split into two nations. And then the north got conquered in 722 B.C. And they intermarried with Gentile nations, and they became the Samaritans. And so the Jews kind of had a, a racist view of them. They saw them as half-bloods, unworthy, dogs, and the Samaritans looked on as the South was then conquered in 587 B.C. with a big grin on their face. They liked watching their southern neighbors, who they had been at war with for all these years, get crushed by the Babylonians. Later on, the Jews had an opportunity to get revenge. So they marched their troops up to Samaria and destroyed a shrine they had made to God. And back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, this blood feud went on. Jews and Samaritans do not associate. They hate each other. Passionately. That's kind of odd. This woman comes out to draw water, and she does it at midday. Midday in the desert is the hottest part of the day. Everyone goes to collect water first thing in the morning when the sun hasn't come up yet. Everybody knows that. Actually, this is a major community hub for women in an ancient Near Eastern village. They would come to the well to chat, to catch up on the gossip, get water for their families, and then go home. This woman comes out to the well alone at the hottest part of the day. Why? Because she is an exile among her own people. They want nothing to do with her. She is an outcast. Why? We can guess, but it might have something to do with the fact that she's gone through five husbands and is on to guy number six. This is someone no one is supposed to talk to. Okay, so she's a Samaritan. Ew. She's out at the well at midday, so it's not appropriate to talk to her. And here's the thing. She's a woman. I know, shocker. It's called the story of the Samaritan woman, right? But here's the thing, in the ancient Near East, a Jewish rabbi was not supposed to talk to a woman alone unless they were related. This was considered very uncouth, very inappropriate. You could only talk to a woman if a male member of her family was there to kind of oversee the conversation. This is a very strange situation. So when the woman comes to Jesus and says, you're a Jew... I'm a Samaritan, 
It's the middle of the day. I'm a woman, you're a rabbi. What part of this don't you get? And Jesus responds, you know, if you knew who was asking you, you'd ask me instead. It's a very unique circumstance. And all throughout it, the woman tries to keep Jesus at arm's length. First she says, hey, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, why are we even talking? Okay, okay, um, even once Jesus starts to show that he's a prophet, and he says, go get your husband and come back, because then we can have one of these, you know, conversation when it's appropriate. Well, I don't have a husband. Okay, now I'm going to expose you, right? Even after all that, she says, okay, I can see that you're a prophet. She goes right back to trying to keep Jesus at arm's length by saying, well, you Jews say we need to worship down there. Samaritans say we need to worship over here. The goal there is, again, to create distance from Jesus. Remember, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan and we're not supposed to be talking right now. And Jesus pushes further. Time is coming and has now come. Okay, I'm going to push back in a way that a Jew can't resist me. I'm going to bring up Messiah. Because that's something the Samaritans and the Jews can agree on. When Messiah comes, he'll explain all this. We're not interested. Thank you. Shut the door in the salesman's face. That's kind of the vibe you get here. And Jesus says, I, the one speaking to you, am he. And in that moment, Jesus did something for this Samaritan woman. He did something very special. What did he do? First, he redeemed her past. See, there was this huge cultural divide between the Samaritans and the Jews. When Jesus embraces this woman and starts having a conversation with her, associates with who he's not supposed to associate with, how does she respond? She runs back to her village and tells them all. And then the whole village comes to talk to Jesus. And then they urge him to stay with them for days. By talking to this woman, Jesus bridges that cultural divide. He redeems that Samaritan part of her past, but not just her cultural identity. Jesus also redeems the mistakes that she has made. She has gone through five husbands and is on to guy number six. We don't know. Maybe she just had really bad luck. But the way Jesus is talking, it seems more like she was living kind of loose. Jesus sees those mistakes in her life, and he uses them to reveal his identity, to prove who he is. Jesus takes the mistakes of her past and uses them for good, instead of the damage that they caused. This is the first thing Jesus does for her. The second thing he does for her is that he reveals her purpose in this life. What's the first thing she does after Jesus reveals himself and she comes to believe in him? What's the first thing she does? She runs back to her village and tells everyone. Don't forget, her village rejected her. She had to come out at midday because no one wanted to talk to her. And now she's the one going door to door. You got to see this guy I met. You got to see this guy I met. He's crazy. He told me everything I ever did. I think he's Messiah. And they're sitting here going like, you know who we are and who you are, right? You're not supposed to be. But she was so excited. She was so genuine, so authentic, that she convinced this village that had exiled her and wanted nothing to do with her to come and see what she had seen. She discovered her purpose to go and tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. And Jesus brought her village back together. He made up for lost time. The third thing that Jesus did, he offered her eternal life. Drink the living water, and even though you die, you will live. Jesus gave the Samaritan woman the gift of time the opportunity to redeem the mistakes of her past, the opportunity to find her purpose. 
the opportunity to have more time with her loved ones, to live forever. Today we are going to receive communion. There's only one rule about communion in the Church of the Nazarene, and that's that anybody who receives communion has to be a believer in Jesus Christ. We don't care if you're Catholic, Orthodox, Methodist, Baptist. So long as you believe in Jesus Christ and you've committed your life to him, you are welcome to join us in communion today. This is a sacred moment, a means of grace, an outward sign of what God does in our hearts. But here's the thing. You have to have received the gift. You have to be following Jesus. Jesus really is the greatest gift ever, greater than any gift we have received in the past. And I just wanted to make sure this morning, since I have your attention on this very special day, a day we won't be able to repeat for 11 years, I just wanted to take this moment and ask you, have you received the gift of Jesus Christ? Are you following him? Has he redeemed your past mistakes and forgiven you of your sin? Has he given you a purpose in this life? A mission to go on? Do you look forward to eternal life in the kingdom of God? If you haven't, And if that's something you want, something you want to be a part of, if you want to start following Jesus today and become a part of his church, a part of his kingdom, to join us at this table, then that opportunity lies before you. And if there's anyone in the house who's been following Jesus for a long time, but maybe you've backslid a little bit, things have gotten out of hand, sins you thought were behind you have worked their way back into your life. You can relate to the woman at the well. Jesus can free you today. He will forgive you 70 times, seven times, which is shorthand for unlimited. And you can join us at the table today too. If you want to follow Jesus today, how do you do that? Paul helps us out. In the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, he explains exactly how we can begin to follow Jesus. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment. Apostle Paul encourages us every time we take communion, before we take it, we should pause to examine our hearts and make sure that we are in right relationship with God. This table is open for anyone who is following Jesus. And if you're not following Jesus today, you can start. It starts very simply. You ask God to forgive you for the wrong that you've done. You declare that Jesus is Lord of your life. That you will follow him all the days that you live. That you believe the gospel, that Jesus came, he lived, he died, and God brought him back from the dead for us. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive you your sins and purify you from all evil. So as we're sitting in this quiet moment, I'm asking no eyes to look around. This is just a moment between you and God. I just wonder, is there anybody here today who wants to choose today to start following Jesus? If that's you, would you just slip up a hand so I can be praying for you? Awesome. All right. Let's pray together. Abba Father, we know you are Lord of all. We know you sent your Son to give us the gift of time, to redeem our past, to give us purpose in the present, and to give us an eternal future with you. 
We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. And for those here today who want to commit to you for the first time or recommit their hearts after a time of being away, I invite you to pray this prayer with me today. Lord, I know that I've sinned against you. I ask you to forgive me. I want to follow you all the days of my life, starting today. You are my Lord, and I trust in you. Lord, for any of you who pray that prayer today, I pray that you would bless them. You encourage them, you'd fill them with your spirit, and they would experience your grace today to have proof that you exist and that you care about them. And Lord, now as we come to your table to receive communion, we pray that you would bless these elements, that you bless them to our bodies, that you bless us to your service, for we know that these are sacred elements, but they are a means of grace. We love you, Lord, today, and we thank you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I'd like to welcome our ushers forward as we receive communion today. Communion is very special to us. We only have two sacraments in the Church of the Nazarene. Sacrament is a sacred action. It symbolizes something greater than the action itself. Our sacraments are baptism and communion, the Lord's Supper. You might have heard it called the Eucharist. This is what Jesus chose to do with his disciples on his last day on earth. He chose to break bread with them and share a meal. When you think to yourself, if I knew today was my last day, what would I do with my time? When Jesus asked himself that question, he said, I'm going to have dinner with my friends. And at the end of it, we're going to sit around and we're going to take these very common things. We're going to take this bread and we're going to invest it with new meaning. It's going to come to symbolize something it's never symbolized before. And we're going to take this cup and God is going to bless it, and it's going to become something it has never been before. In the same way that many heads of grain are crushed and brought together to make bread, in the same way many grapes are crushed and brought together to fill the cup, so we are all brought together to be one body. Communion is very special to us. It's more than juice and bread. And if you guys are running short, I do have another tray, which is exciting. Thank you, Cole. Cole, did you get some for yourself? Communion on Christmas or Christmas Eve has been a tradition in my family for a very long time. Actually, I can't remember a time in my family where we didn't share in communion at church on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. I hope in your own families that you have... Mason has the last tray. <laughs> um, I hope in your own families that you have traditions, that you pause with your family and you reflect on them why you have those traditions, what they mean. Another tradition in our family, every Christmas Eve, we read the story of Christ's birth. And it was actually kind of sweet. My sister called me yesterday and said, 
hey, you know how dad always read us the Christmas story? What chapter and verse is that? I can never remember. And so they were reading that together last night. It was very cool. So I hope you have these kinds of traditions in your family too. And if you don't, start them. I'm 35. I remember the first time my dad had me read the Christmas story instead of him reading it. That was a special moment. I remember the first time I got to serve communion on Christmas instead of being the one who received it. It was very special. Take these opportunities. Don't miss the holidays and the opportunity to talk about what we believe and why we believe it. All right. So, you can join me in taking the bread and the juice. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he told his disciples, this is my body, which is for you. Do this whenever you eat of it in remembrance of me. So take, eat, remember, and be grateful. In the same way, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and he said, This cup is a new covenant written in my blood. My blood will be poured out for the sins of the many. Do this whenever you drink of it and remember me. So now take, drink, remember, and be grateful. Let's pray together. Abba Father, we thank you this Christmas day for your son, for what he means to us, and for what he has done for us. We love you, Lord. And today we remember that it's not just about a cute nativity, but that you did come for a purpose. We thank you for carrying that work out, and we thank you for saving us. Lord, may today be a very Merry Christmas. We love you, and all God's people said.